Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with a repertoire, the best and not quite as best versions of Schubert's Die Winterreise, his ultimate song cycle. And oh my goodness, what a piece of music it is. And what a chore it's been going through all these recordings, but also a delight. I mean, there's just so many of them. And, I, you know, I'm, usually I do the best and the worst, but this is one of those... I, I don't see the point in talking about bad ones. I mean, are there any? Well, there are some, but you know, it's one of those works where most people don't do it unless they're really ready to give it their all. And so I don't feel there's any need to really trash many of them. I mean, you can do that, you know, yourselves and with your own, your own collection. And I've already got 20 versions here, which represent at least double that because all of the singers who do Vinterizza seem to be unable to prevent themselves from doing it multiple times. And that is what made this such a chore because you've got a zillion versions of the same thing by the same person, not necessarily the same pianist sometimes, but not always. And that's very, very complicated. And the fact of the matter is, um, De Vinterizer brings us head to head with the phenomenon of sequels or remakes that are seldom as good as the originals. Because in general, and I'm speaking in gross generalities here, but in general, when a singer or any artist remakes something, something that they worked very hard at the first time and took very, very, very seriously and did really, really well, the only reason to redo it is to change it somehow. And it's a classic case of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I mean, there wasn't anything they need to do, but they have to. They have to do something different to justify doing it again, or some new, what they call insights, which may or may not be insightful. And so they change things around. However subtly, they change things around. And those changes are seldom for the better. I mean, they can be, I suppose, but usually not. Usually, usually you, what you, you gain in insight, you lose in spontaneity or freshness or the, the joy of discovery or the fact, quite simply, that the singer was in better voice originally than they are 20 years later or 10 years later or even whenever, whatever the circumstances may be. And so I have some versions here by the same person multiple times, some versions by one person who did multiple times. It's really kind of extraordinary. I mean, it really is how many Vinterizes there are by the same bunch of singers. And oh my goodness, it's just dozens and dozens of them. So I've, I've really whittled it down to the versions that I think um, are either worth exploring or for reasons that we'll go into not worth exploring um, because they were remakes that never should have been remade in my version, in my, in my view. So let's get started, okay? Uh, the work itself, well, we all know it's Schubert's most harrowing single piece of music. Um, it was published in two clumps of 12 songs. There are 24 songs in all. And, and it, it was written in two parts. So you can do it actually with like an intermission in the middle. They all last about an hour and five, an hour and 10 minutes, somewhere in there, 70 ish minutes. Some of these slower versions can go on forever and add 10 minutes to that, which is not a good idea. It really, really isn't. Um, because the piece really thrives on contrast, especially given the fact that the music itself is often quite dark and bleak, and you really want to give it as much as, as much variety and color as you possibly can. It requires an extraordinary range of vocal ability from the singers, and I've got recordings that really come from the the dawn of the recorded era through like really rather recently. Um, it has an amazing number of fine recordings by singers, male and female, plus their arrangements. I'm not talking about arrangements. I'm talking about the basic piece for voice and piano. And the voice can be, if it's a male, tenor or baritone, there are versions for both, or uh, mezzo-soprano, soprano, there are versions for that too. Um, everybody wants to sing it. Why? Because it's so rewarding and because it has such emotional depth and richness of expression. So we begin with one of the classic historical female recordings with Lotte Lehmann. Lotte Lehmann was, of course, the, the goddess of German leader um, in the pre-LP era. You know, she founded the, the, what was it, the Conservatory of the West or whatever it's called out there and taught 
you know, song singing to all kinds of famous people like Marilyn Horn and whatnot. And anyway, this is her recording with Paul Ulanovsky. Um, it's the reissue on Pearl Records because they always do excellent remasterings. And it's a beautiful performance, a very sensitive performance. And of course, she had the, she had the, 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 the personality to pull the thing off. One of the things that I like about this for performance particularly is the variety that she brings to the songs that have that have, um, you know, contrasting tempos. Like, um, well, let's see, the, the Wasserflus, that's what, Wasserflut, pardon me, that's one of them. Or uh, Frühlingstraum, things like that, where you've got a lot of variety and expression. And she really brings it out. And she sings, by the way, um, in a manner which is much less affected than a lot of leader singers do today. Uh, she really does. I mean, she, she has a naturalness to her delivery, which I think is quite lovely. So uh, this was where my Winterreise collection began, or the year in which it begins. I mean, I wasn't there in that year, but that's the recording. And after that, we have a couple of historical recordings by the same person, Hans Hotter. Now, this is the one that I kind of like the best, the one with Gerald Moore on EMI Classics. It's mono. Um, and also this later one, I believe it's later, let me make sure I'm not like going completely insane, uh, on Deutsche Grammophon. Now, the, this Winterreise is with, who is it, Eric, Eric Verba, I believe is the pianist, not Jeffrey Parsons, although he's on the same disc, I can tell you exactly. Um, yeah, it's Eric, it's Eric Verba. And Hotter was, of course, the great Wotan of his day, or one of the great Wotans of his day. Um, I really like Der Liermann. I always actually judge my Winterreises by Liermann. And the reason I, I, I tend to think about Liermann is because I think about Liermann as sort of the, the test piece is because it's so simple. And so it, it, it leaves the singer really rather naked. And there has to be a real distinction between what the accompanist does, who has very little to work with, and the singer, um, who also has very little to work with. It's really very, very interesting. So one of the things that Hotter does in Liermann, which I think is just so marvelous, is that they, he and Gerald Moore adopt two different tempi. When the piano is playing the interludes, it's absolutely mechanical, which is what it has to be because it's a hurdy-gurdy, it's a mechanical device, right? But when the singer sings, when Hotter sings, he's much more flexible, but he doesn't ever break the line or break the rhythm. He simply, he simply is commenting on what he's seeing. And you have two separate frames of reference within the same song. It's a marvelous effect. And I don't think anyone's done it as well as he has in this particular recording, the EMI recording. The DG recording is a little quicker. Um, and for that reason, I think it, owes, it has a little bit less sort of flexibility built into it. But I, they're both beautiful performances, and he was a great singer, and this was one of his signature, signature roles. It really is a role, isn't it? I mean, you know, a, a great operatic baritone or tenor really is going to get into these songs. You can't sing them in an operatic way. You can't be histrionic the way you can on the operatic stage, but you're, it's still about a character. And you can build character into these songs. And Hans Hotter does it just wonderfully, wonderfully well. Then we have a couple recordings on Bis. Now, this is the more recent of the two, James Rutherford with Eugene Asti Piano. Uh, this one came out, this is an SACD. It's, it's quite recent, 2021, I guess. Yeah, just a few years ago. Uh, I'm not fond of this. I'm not fond of it because I think Rutherford has a voice that's just a little bit unwieldy unwieldy, whatever you call it, a little bit awkward for the role. It's a heavy baritone. It's a dark baritone. I like darkness. Don't get me wrong. Darkness is really cool. But there are songs here like, you know, for the, what is it? The Raven or whatever that thing is. The Crow. De Clea. That's here. That's here somewhere. What number is that? There, out there. Oh, there it is. De Clea. Yeah, number 15. And, and, and Ehrlicht. And some of the other ones that require a sort of lightness of voice and quickness of delivery and the staccato articulation. And he has problems with that. The voice doesn't really want to respond. And it also has kind of like a bit of a wobble here and there, I think, or a vibrato. I don't know what you'd call it, but, but a lack of firmness that precludes a kind of simplicity of utterance that I think some of these songs, for example, um, you know, Einsamkeit at the end of part one, things like that really sort of demand. So I, I, it's not bad, it's certainly not bad. It's, it's, it's expressive and it's serious as all of these performances are, but I found it to be um, just a little bit, a little bit unappealing. 
Uh, this one, on the other hand, with Peter Maté and Lars David Nilsson piano, I think is better. Uh, the acoustic of the recording is a little bit more echoey. It sounds a little, you're more conscious of, you know, sort of a singer and a piano and it's sort of like a, an empty space than you are in the other recording, the more recent one. But I think Peter Maté has a more natural delivery and a more attractive overall tone. And it's, it's, a, it's a very beautiful performance. I mean, I've listened to it several times now, and I, I you know, I'm, aside from when it first came out, and I, I find myself enjoying it more on repetition, so that's a good thing. So that, that's a decent one. Then there's this one, which just came out, with Benjamin Apple and James Balieu piano on Alpha, Alpha Classics. I don't know if it just came out, but I mean, I don't pay much attention to dates. You know, I just sort of hang on to these things. And this was, what, 2021? All right, so it's fairly recent again. Um, and it's typical of, I think, the young singers who take on the role. I, I mean, Apple has a lovely voice. Um, Balia plays extremely well and accompanies very well. The sonics are very good. I think that, like a lot of young singers, um, there is a tendency to try to, maybe to try too hard sometimes to overinterpret a little bit and a couple of the songs here I find that there's a there's a, a, a kind of you know over enunciation of the text maybe in in, in Der Greise, Der Greise Kopf or, or in which one which the other one I was thinking of um, maybe Tauschung or, or, or Das Wirtshaus, uh, Wirtshaus, Wirtshaus, Wirtshaus Pardon my German, folks. I'm trying. I really am. Anyway, um, but he has he has the the guts for the for moot for you know the big songs, the ones that require a certain projection, and um, it's it's a good good performance, a fresh performance that I enjoyed. So there you go. Then we have a classic. Well, it's a sort of classic. At least it's well known. Uh, what we got here? Ian Bostridge. Ian Bostridge with uh, with, with what's his name? playing the different people playing the piano. In this case, it's, it's life of Anzness. Now, Bostridge is one of those, you know, he's like the Elizabeth Schwarzkopf with, you know, male genitalia. You know, he, he, he tends to really make a lot out of the text. And this can drive you crazy. Some people, it does drive crazy. Um, I, I think that what he does with the text is, is rather intelligent. I mean, he wrote a whole book on Vinterizo, which I, I read, actually, and which strikes me as kind of nonsensical in a lot of places. Um, but he's obviously completely captivated by the work, by the music, which he's recorded multiple times. I think this is his best one. Um, and I really think that when it comes down to, you know, these sort of hyper-expressive, you know, make every note count versions, you have to be careful. You have to be very, very careful that you don't let the incidental detail, the emphasis of any one moment, um, obliterate the long, the long lyrical line of the song. And Bostridge manages that here. He really does. I think this particular box that has, it has Dishina Muller in with uh, Mitsuko Uchida uh, p piano and Schwaninger song with Antonio Papano at the piano. I mean, it's really a very, very fine um, Schubert collection of, of its type. And it's a type that, you know, you'll, you, some people really enjoy and some people really don't. You also get a DVD here all about, let's see, a unique dramatization of Schubert's terrifying and deeply moving song cycle with studio sets, actors, costumes, and props uh, performed by Ian Bostridge with Julius Drake at the piano. I didn't watch it. I have to confess, I couldn't. I don't want to. I'm afraid. <laughs> I really am. Maybe one of you who's seen it can tell me what it what it does. I I I, I think there's there there is something to be said for having a little bit of restraint and letting my imagination fill in instead of having someone else's idea of what the imagery ought to be. At least that's that's how I feel about it today. Now we now have two recordings by uh, tenor Mark Padmore. Padmore is a marvelous tenor, um, and this is a classic case of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. The version that wasn't broke, which if you, you can still find, is this one with Paul Lewis. They're both on Harmonia Mundi, same label. So they're both on Harmonia Mundi, and it's a very, very beautiful performance. I think very affecting, very natural. It's another one of those flowing, uh, he, he sings, but he, 
when he emotes, it just flows with the, the music. It's a little bit maybe understated, but that's not entirely a bad thing here. And it's gorgeous. In Lyreman, um, I, I find Lewis's accompaniment to be rather ordinary, actually. But um, elsewhere, it's really very, very good, and it's very beautifully sung, and it's fine. So why not do it again? Not as well. Well, what's the gimmick in the remake? The gimmick is to have Christian Bezuidenhut playing on a Graf Forte piano. Blah! Who cares? First of all, Bezuidenhut is one of the least interesting keyboard artists I think I've ever heard of. It's hard for me to forgive him. He's like Beethoven and whatnot. It's just been wretched. And, and this isn't wretched. It isn't, but it draws attention time and again to the thing that you shouldn't be paying attention to, which is the pianist, frankly, um, compared to the words and the singer. And, and it, it encourages Padmore to try and do more. And he didn't need to do more. He did more than enough in his first recording. So, you know, there you go. There's a case in point, right? Now we've got, let's see, some more stuff with like tenor people, I think, here, right? Don't we? I hope. Yes, Die Winterreise, it's on disc three. Good Lord. Christoph Plegardien with Andreas Steyer. Yeah, now Andreas Steyer is a forte pianist, and he's a great forte pianist. You see, that's the difference here. Let me see if he, I hope he's the one who's doing it here, unless I'm like making myself completely nuts. You know, I have to go through these again. You know, I, I thought that I had all of this like memorized, but you know, who am I kidding? I, it's not memorized. I don't memorize anything. Okay, Vinterize said, no, it's Michael Gies, piano. Forget it. I'm talking about, about forte pianos. Where's the forte piano in here? There must be one because I love this set. Uh, Michael Gies, piano, and in disc two, Andre Steyer, forte piano, Schubert, Ludwig, Rellstab, Schwan, and Gazong. Okay. So it's the Schwanig is on with the forte piano. The rest is with the regular piano. That must be why I like the forte piano so much in this version, because it wasn't a forte piano at all. It was a regular piano. Doesn't matter. Perfectly marvelous performance. Absolutely wonderful. Beautifully sensitive, intelligent, well put together. Both parts reach a natural climax. I really like that. I like it when 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 Einsamkeit is really you know, it makes sense to be the end of part one, and then you sort of take a breath and you start over with part two. And, oh, it's just beautifully done. Very, very nicely done. It's on what label is this? Challenge Classics. Yeah. So that's really, really good. Now back to baritones. Baritones. Lots of baritones. Okay. Hermann Pry. Hermann Pry is one of the classic German baritone guys, right? I mean, he did this stuff a bazillion times. There's also one on Denon, I think, that I... I have somewhere around here, but I didn't pull it out. Okay, so the first one, maybe the best, is this one. Um, it's, I think, with Gerald Moore, right? Uh, Vinterizer, there it is, CD2. It's on CD2. There's CD2, Vinterizer, and it doesn't even say who's doing it. Because why should they tell us? It's just too easy. I mean, if we can go search. Yes, yeah, Gerald Moore, of course it is. Wait, no, no, it's not. It's, uh, let's see, Vinterizer with Carl Engel. There we go. Carl Engel from 1962. Now, Hermit Pry is like the Fisher D. Scale for singers who like good voices. Not that Fisher D. Scale did have a good voices, but good voice, but Hermit Pry always really sang the role and sang it beautifully. He does here, and he sings it beautifully here with Wolfgang Savalisch, who may have been kind of a, on Phillips, he may have been kind of a dullish um, conductor off it is not. Um, at least the symphonic repertoire, but he was a splendid leader accompanist, and he's a wonderful accompanist here. Um, this one dates from, let's get the date here, and let's be clear, 1973. It was recorded in 71, pardon me. So uh, about 10 years after this one. And Pry is in fresher voice here, but this is a, a very beautiful performance. This is a case where you know, it's the exception that proves the rule, where, where the remake is really as good as the original, and so I'm not complaining about it. I think in his last ones, for, for Denon, he was not in as good a voice as he is in these recordings, but that's really cool. But of course, we must talk about Dietrich Fischer-Dieskau, the Schubert singer, to end all Schubert singers, 
at least that's what he thought. Um, this is my favorite of the, I think he did six or seven Vinterizes. I just endless quantities of them. There was one on EMI. There was a whole slew of them here on DG. Um, this is with Gerald Moore. Um, Gerald Moore was, of course, an amazing leader accompanist. He really was. And he does a beautiful job accompanying Fisher T. Scow, who sings throughout. He sings very nicely. This was issued in 1972. So Fisher T. Scow was in good shape vocally when he did this, these recordings. And it's beautiful. Now, there was a tendency for a lot of these hotshot singers who had to remake things because they had to do it every couple of years to find major pianists to do it with. I think, for, didn't Fisher D. Scow do one with Alfred Brendel? I have it sitting in the Brendel box somewhere. Brendel did it with somebody in the Brendel box. I know that. But, uh, you know, and, and we'll get to that in a minute. And having these, like, star pianists, it's not always a help. Again, it tends to deflect attention from where it ought to be. Remember, these are songs. Let's not, let's not, you know, however artful they are, and however beautiful Schubert's accompaniments are, they are accompaniments. And the focus must always be on the voice, the quality of the singing, um, the delivery of the text, and the accompanist has to support that. And Gerald Moore understood that. He had more than enough technique and personality to take center stage when he needed to, but he also understood his role. And that is just something that, you know, you can't, you don't always get when you have like hotshot pianists playing these things, quite frankly. Although, although you know, some of them get it. Some of them do. They do. They're good colleagues. Back to the ladies, Krista Ludwig with James Levine. Now, Krista Ludwig was one of the great singers of the 20th century. She was one of the great leader singers. She was brought up and educated by her singer parents in that leader tradition, the tradition of German art song. She taught it. She lived it. She breathed it. She sang it like nobody else. She's gorgeous. And this was a late, a late recording of hers. Um, I'm glad she was able to do it and to leave her interpretation of the song because her style, her sense of style is impeccable. It is weird, as it was with Lotte Lehmann, to hear, you know, the text, which they don't change. I, they ought to just change the words. She spoke of marriage or she spoke of, you know, getting together and the mother spoke of marriage. Well, you know, you can change it to he. I mean, you could, the maiden, the guy. I mean, there are ways to finagle it maybe to make it be a little bit more logical. The singer is obviously male in these songs, but that's okay. The idea is, is, is if you're interested in great musicianship and beautiful singing, Crystal Ludwig delivers both. And so I, I'm, I'm not in a position to complain. Now, let's see, who else, who else do we have here? Oh, yes, Benjamin Britten and Peter Pears. This is a great Vinterizer and a great Stuna Mullerin. I mean, it, it, Peter Pears' voice is an acquired taste. We know that. A lot of leader singers' voices are acquired tastes because, you know, it, it doesn't, you don't have to have the best voice in the world to sing songs. I mean, think of Rod Stewart doing Die Winterreise, you know? I mean, you know, some of these people have absolutely raw, awful voices. What matters, what matters, what matters is that they have character and intelligence and they know how to use what they've got. And Peter Pears really knew how to use what he had. And Benjamin Britten really knew how to accompany um, in this music. He was a fabulous Schubertian, generally speaking. There was something about Schubert, I think, that really affected Britten. He played a lot of Schubert's chamber music. He conducted it. He really, really got into Schubert. Um, and this is a wonderful, wonderful cycle. It was actually, if you're going for tenor versions, it's, it's one of the best. Absolutely one of the best. I mean, Pierre's diction is impeccable. His handling of the words is absolutely beautiful. Um, he understands exactly what's going on. He and Britain play off of each other beautifully. They, you know, they're lovers and partners and they, you know, they're not, they're not out to, you know, you know, out ego each other. Um, and uh, on Decca, this is, this is a great set. It's just a great set. It really, really is. So then we have to talk about Wolfgang Holtzmeier. Yes, um, Wolfgang Holtzbeer is a wonderful baritone, and he, and he released, you know, the three big song cycles here um, on Deco. He was Phillips, I believe, um, with Imogen Cooper, who is a first-class Schubert pianist. I mean, she accompanies wonderfully well. He has such a beautiful voice. I mean, this is really a Winterizer for voice people. I mean, he sings so beautifully, and then, of course, it's out of print. So there is this other one he made with Andreas Haefliger, 
um, piano on Capriccio, and I think this one came later, right, 2013. So yeah, in Vienna. So this one was was done first in 1994, um, 1994, 90 something, in 2000. So yes, this one is a little bit later. The voice is a little fresher here. I think that's safe to say, but it's not a huge difference. It's not crazy. And if you want to hear a, a really beautiful Winterreiser, really, really well sung, you can get the Capriccio or you can get Decca if you can still find it. I mean, there was also a, a Holtzmere box, I think a big box that I have sitting around somewhere over there, maybe. I think. I don't even remember, to be honest with you, because there's just so much stuff coming out lately, but I'm pretty sure. And uh, so that's in there, if it, if it exists. I have to go check. I don't know. Anyway, Holtzmere is wonderful. Now, while we're hanging out with baritones, we also have to talk about Matthias Goerner. And Goerner did it in the, was the guy who did it for the complete Schubert song edition, um, you know, which is absolutely amazing with Graham Johnson, piano, who's absolutely amazing. His performance, I think, is one of the best because of its scrupulous e examination or adherence to the composer's dynamics. You will never hear a, a Lyrman softer. It's so beautifully done, so dead. So it's scary. It's really, really gorgeous. But Goerner, of course, made, I don't know, he did it twice more. I think he did it with Alfred Brendel. It wasn't the other guy here, whoever I was, Herman Pry, I don't know, whoever I was talking about. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, Goerner redid it and redid it and redid it. And it, the fact of the matter is, um, he never did it better than here. The problem with this is that the individual CD on Hyperion, which you can download, um, doesn't exist anymore as a single disc, as a physical product. And unfortunately, in the complete Schubert edition, this is the book, it took me like half an hour to find it because it's the Schubert edition runs chronologically by year, and in this case, by date of publication. And so half of Die Winterreise is on like disc 33. The other half is on like disc 35. It drove me crazy. And you're not going to want to like dig around to get both halves of it. But then again, there's no point in getting Matthias Gernot just to have him on one CD. So what was the deal with that? It's one of the great Winterreise. It ought to be available as an integral unit. This is one of those, those cases where um, you know, pedantry, uh, you know, scholarly pedantry may have gotten, um, you know, the best of them and trumped, uh, you know, musical good sense, at least in the big box. But the big box is out of print too, I think now, isn't it? I mean, so why am I even talking about this? I don't know. It's just frustrating. And let's see. So we're down to the last two. And I've brought, I've, I've reduced everything to a tenor and a baritone. Now, of course, Schubert wrote Die Winterreise for tenor. It's written for tenor, but it's really become the province of baritones because, well, it's such a dark piece anyway, and the slightly heavier voice and darker coloration seems to suit the music so terribly well. But there are some amazing versions, as we've seen, sung by tenors. And my choice among the tenors is of this one. It's Peter Schreier and Andras Schiff. Uh, Schiff, of course, is a hotshot solo pianist, but he's one of those hotshot solo pianists who's not such a hotshot. In other words, he doesn't have one of those all-consuming, overarching, egomaniacal personalities that's going to, you know, clobber everybody else that he works with. Um, he's actually an extremely sensitive accompanist, accompanist and a very, very effective one. I mean, he's recorded the complete Schubert piano music, or almost all of it, and he did it very sensitively. He's very, very good. And Peter Schreier is a great, great leader singer. He's another tenor who doesn't have the most voluptuous tenor voice. He's not a Heldon tenor. He's really a leader tenor. That's what he does. And he does it amazingly well. And these were recorded, let me see, in, let's see, Die Winterreise was 1980, 1991 or 81? 81, it looks like. Holy crap. Was it that early? Yeah. No, 91. I'm sorry. 1991. And uh, so that's already, what, 30 some odd years ago? Unbelievable. He was an excellent voice. This was a good time for him to be doing these songs. And, and the playing is, is wonderfully, one, the singing and playing are wonderfully unaffected and extremely poignant, really poignant. I mean, he, he, he gets, he gets the, the heavier, slower songs um, without, without too much melodrama 
but with just just the right touch of of exhaustion, if you want to call it that. Maybe the timbre of his voice helps that, but he has the lightness for the, the crows and the earlicht and all the, the quicker ones, and he has the, the tone for moot, for courage at the very end. Really, really understands, I think, the range of the piece. Now, he made another recording of it with Sviatoslav Richter at creepy slow tempos. And Schreier actually was on record as saying, well, I was shocked at how slow the tempos were, but eventually I came around and it turned out beautifully and all that PR stuff they have to say. This is the one to get, the one that flows better and that is not overwhelmed by the eccentric personality of the guy whose job it is to accompany. Listen to the singer singing. That's a great performance, it really is. And if I want to hear the piece by tenor, Schreier is my pick. And for baritone, no, it's not Fisher Dieskow. You may be shocked to find out, even though he made five or six really very fine recordings of Die Eyes. For me, it's a new one, a relatively new one. This one with uh, Roman Trekel, baritone, and Ulrich Eisenlohr, piano. Now, Eisenlohr was the, was the um, pianistic force, as with, you know, Graham Johnson and, and Hyperion, behind Naxos's complete Schubert edition, which, quite frankly, is every bit as good as the Hyperion Schubert edition. It's very, very well put together with wonderful singers. And Roman Trekel is a terrific baritone. I, he really is. He has the, the, the heaviness and darkness of voice to really, really twist the knife in the bleaker songs. But he also can lighten his voice when necessary. He has wonderful power and force. He's young and fresh. And you know, he has all the advantages of a, a younger and more youthful, youthful voice, um, but all of the, the, the wonderful expressionist angst that you want in, 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 in Schubert's Winterreise. And because I have permission to use samples, we're going to hear all of Liermann. I'm going to play it for you now, all four minutes and 17 seconds. One of the slower versions of it. Um, usually the song can last anywhere from like three and a bit to up to about four. Um, this is, I think, an amazing performance because of two things. First, there is Trakel's very, very plangent, absolutely devastated delivery. He catches the numbness and rises to a wonderfully heartbreaking climax at the end without screaming. Actually, you're not supposed to rise to any climax at all, but most singers make a crescendo at the end. And just as fine, frankly, is Eisenlohr's accompaniment. You know, he gets the dissonance in, in the grace notes, the grace notes for the, you know, hurdy-gurdy, and, and the inner lines. There are very, very sparse inner parts of the piano accompaniment which have passing notes that clash amazingly, wonderfully, fabulously with the, uh, with the uh, vocal line. And this is the most dissonant recorded performance of Lyrman I think that I've ever heard. It's so powerful because that gentle, gentle, devastating amount of, of, of harmonic acerbity and dissonance, just, it's just fabulous. So I want you to hear it. I want you to give it a listen, the whole thing. Here it is, Daryl Lyermann with Roman Trakel and Ulrich Eisenlohr. My however choice, the one that I choose when I want to listen to Winterreise on Naxos. Surprising, isn't it? But, you know, all this real-time listening really just brought home how fabulous this recording is. Have a listen.
pretty powerful stuff, huh? Of course, it always is. It's amazing. So there you have it, my friends. 20 recordings at least of Vinterizer, plus the mention of at least 20 more. Um, and I hope this gives you a, a large sample to play around with and have a good time with and enjoy yourself listening to. I mean, it is a joy to listen to, however devastating and, and dark the music. It really is a glorious piece of music. And it's been, uh, uh, you know, uh, a job, but a very happy job to uh, listen to all these recordings again after so many years and talk to you about them all. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care.